Good afternoon. Uh, NATO foreign ministers will meet next uh, week to address uh, pressing security issues. We will address uh, Russia's continuing military buildup in and around uh, Ukraine. This is the second time this year that Russia has massed uh, large and unusual concentration of forces uh, in the region. This includes heavy capabilities like tanks, artillery, armored units, drones, and electronic warfare systems, as well as combat-ready troops. This uh, military buildup is unprovoked and unexplained. It raises tensions and it risks uh, miscalculations. Russia must show transparency, reduce tensions and de-escalate. NATO's approach to Russia remains unchanged. We keep our defense and deterrence strong while remaining open for dialogue. We regret that Russia has cut off diplomatic ties with NATO because in times like uh, this, uh, dialogue is more important than ever. We will also discuss the situation in the region with uh, Georgia and Ukraine. They are close and highly valued partners that aspire for membership. And NATO supports them both politically and practically. NATO foreign ministers will also address the situation on the border with Belarus. And the Lukashenko's uh, regime's cynical exploitation of vulnerable people to put pressure on our allies, uh, Poland, Latvia and Lithuania. I discussed this issue with President Duda yesterday, and on Sunday, I will travel to Lithuania and Latvia together with the President of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Close cooperation between NATO and the European Union is essential to counter this hybrid campaign, which aims to destabilize our countries. Foreign ministers will also address NATO's role in arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. We have a strong track record on these issues. Since the Cold War, NATO reduced the number of nuclear weapons in Europe by more than 90%. All allies support the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. And NATO is determined to maintain its leading role on arms control. But we should not be naive. Russia continues to develop and deploy new weapon systems. Just last week, Russia conducted a reckless anti-satellite missile test, which put the International Space Station at risk. China is also rapidly expanding its conventional and nuclear arsenal, providing no transparency about its capabilities and showing little interest to engage in arms control. Ministers would also address Afghanistan. Following the rapid collapse of the Afghan government and the armed forces in, Af in Afghanistan in August, I launched a comprehensive assessment of our engagement. The return of Taliban is tragic for the Afghan people and it's heartbreaking for all of us. NATO went into Afghanistan to prevent terrorists from using the country again to attack us. And since 9-11, there has been no terrorist attack against our countries from Afghanistan. But we must recognize that over the years, the international community set a level of ambition that went well beyond the original aim of fighting terrorism. And on that, we were not able to deliver, despite our sacrifice and considerable investment. So I expect uh, ministers will consult as we did throughout our engagement and identify the right lessons for our future crisis management operations. We will also discuss NATO's next strategic concept, our blueprint for the next decade and beyond. It needs to take into account uh, new realities, including Russia's aggressive actions and a more assertive China, 
emerging and disruptive technologies, and the security impact of climate change. It will drive our, uh, our continued adaptation in a more competitive world. Finally, we will address the developments in the Western Balkans. The region is of strategic importance uh, for NATO. It has come a long way since the conflicts of the 1990s. But we have recently seen tensions rise. In Kosovo, NATO troops are working together with EU diplomats to ease tensions on the border and implement the recent agreement between Belgrade and Pristina. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, we strongly support the unified state structures and the country's multi-ethnic armed forces. But we are concerned about the inflammatory rhetoric coming from Republika Srpska. So we will discuss NATO's continued role in promoting stability and security in the region. Our colleagues from Finland, Sweden will join us for this session, as well as EU High Representative Borrell. Because we are stronger and more effective when we work together, so I look forward uh, to meeting NATO foreign ministers in uh, Riga. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, we'll start with Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Thanks a lot. Uh, Secretary uh, General, I'm here. Um, the incoming German government has stated its uh, intent to join the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as an observer. How do you view this um, um, as the Secretary General of an alliance that uh, continues to rely on uh, nuclear deterrence? Let me first uh, congratulate the incoming government. Uh, I welcome the new uh, platform. Uh, I think uh, that is a platform that states clearly that uh, Germany will continue to be uh, committed to NATO, to be a strong uh, and reliable ally in uh, NATO. And I know uh, the incoming Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and uh, he has uh, proven uh, again and again that he is a strong supporter of a transatlantic bond, and I look forward to working with uh, him. I also uh, welcome the clear message in the platform that uh, um, Germany will uh, stand by its commitments in NATO. Uh, I welcome also the uh, decision to uh, continue to be part of NATO's nuclear sharing arrangements, which are essential for our uh, deterrence, and it also is a multinational framework within NATO to make sure that European allies take part in this critical part of our uh, uh, deterrence and uh, defense posture. Um, I also welcome that the platform clearly states that uh, uh, um, there is a need to invest uh, in, uh, in equipment, uh, in capabilities for the Bundeswehr, for the uh, German armed forces. And I expect the Germany to continue to invest more because the NATO commitment to invest more is based on very specific capability targets for each and every ally, including uh, 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 Germany. Then on the ban treaty, all allies agree that uh, we should not sign up to the treaty, uh, uh, should not be a part of the treaty, uh, because uh, we believe in a, a balanced, uh, verifiable um, arms control. Uh, all allies uh, 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 agree that the aim is a world without nuclear weapons, uh, but the way to get there, uh, the path uh, uh, to get to a world without nuclear weapons, is balanced, verifiable arms control, not unilateral uh, arms control. Uh, and a world where we get rid of our nuclear weapons, but uh, where China, uh, Russia, and countries like North Korea uh, continue to uh, have nuclear weapons is not a safer world. So the aim is a world without nuclear weapons, but as long as nuclear weapons exist, uh, NATO will uh, retain a nuclear deterrent. Um, there are different views on the issue of uh, observing uh, uh, the treaty. Uh, I welcome the fact that uh, Germany so clearly, and in the new government platform, so clearly states that it will consult with allies on this issue, because we need to speak with one voice on uh, all issues related to uh, nuclear uh, issues, uh, because uh, this is important for the whole alliance. We'll go to the third row, Ukraine National News Agency. 
Dmitrius Kurko here. Uh, Dmitrius Kurko, National News Agency of Ukraine. Um, Secretary General, it is more or less clear what kind of threats uh, now Ukraine stand uh, in front of. But uh, can you elaborate a little bit about the challenges uh, for Euro-Atlantic uh, security in a whole because of that uh, events? And uh, the second question, if I may. Yesterday you mentioned that, uh, and uh, confirm again, that uh, NATO is ready uh, to meet and to discuss with Russia in format NRC uh, the issues, including the issues around uh, uh, Ukraine. What kind of issues could be discussed in that uh, circumstances? Thank you. So we are, of course, concerned about what we see in and around Ukraine. Uh, we see an unusual concentration of uh, forces, of military Russian capabilities. And this is the second time this year that I amassed these kind of uh, troops uh, close to Ukraine's uh, borders. Uh, this is uh, something that happens in parallel or combined with uh, aggressive rhetoric by Russia. Uh, there's no certainty about the, the intentions of Russia. But what we do know is that they have con concentrated forces close to Ukraine's uh, borders. And we also know that uh, Russia has used military force against Ukraine before. Uh, they continue to illegally annex Crimea. Uh, they continue to destabilize eastern Ukraine, Donbass. And they continue to launch uh, uh, cyber and hybrid attacks against uh, uh, Ukraine. So if putting all this together, uh, of course, there are reasons to be uh, deeply concerned about the developments we see uh, along the borders of Ukraine. And therefore, we call on Russia to be transparent, uh, to uh, uh, de-escalate, and to reduce uh, uh, tensions. It is also clear that if Russia uses force against Ukraine, uh, that will have costs, that will have consequences, and, uh, and therefore, uh, we continue to call on Russia to de-escalate. Um, NATO's approach to Russia remains unchanged. We need to be firm, we need strong deterrence and defense, but at the same time, we believe in meaningful dialogue with Russia. And we continue to call uh, on Russia to sit down and talk, uh, and especially when times are difficult as they are now, I think it's even more important that we uh, have open lines uh, of communications for a dialogue. Therefore, we regret the Russian uh, decision not uh, to participate in a meeting of the NATO-Russia Council. We have been inviting Russia now for 18 months, and they have still not answered. Uh, but what we have seen is that uh, uh, Russia recently decided to uh, close down uh, NATO's uh, military office in, uh, in Moscow and suspend our our diplomatic office or civilian office in, uh, in Moscow and also suspend uh, Russia's uh, diplomatic mission to NATO. Uh, we urge Russia to uh, revise these decisions and to uh, sit down and engage in uh, dialogue with, uh, with NATO. We'll go to Rustavi too. General, as we know, uh, Georgia's and uh, Ukraine's ministers uh, are invited to Riga ministerial. So, can you tell us more details which issues will be discussed uh, with the ministers of these countries? So, first of all, I very much look forward to uh, meeting the foreign ministers of uh, Georgia and Ukraine in Riga next week. Uh, both countries are highly valued uh, partners of NATO. We work closely with them and we are expanding our cooperation and we welcome both uh, the contributions of uh, uh, both Georgia and Ukraine to NATO, but also uh, we really believe that NATO is uh, supporting uh, uh, both countries, Georgia and Ukraine, in a positive uh, and, and helpful uh, way. Um, we will discuss the security situation in the Black Sea region. Uh, both Georgia and Ukraine are literal states to the Black Sea. Uh, we have seen increased tensions. Uh, we have seen uh, Russia's aggressive actions against Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, uh, to discuss, to address uh, together with, with uh, these two key partners, the situation in the Black Sea uh, is very timely and extremely important. Uh, then uh, we will also uh, focus on the uh, reform efforts uh, I think it is important for both these aspirant countries to stay focused on reform, uh, implement reform, uh, fight corruption, modern, modernize their uh, uh, defense and security institutions. Uh, all of this is important, 
partly because it helps to move Georgia towards, uh, uh, closer towards NATO and NATO membership, but also because uh, these reforms, uh, they have value in themselves. They make Georgia, uh, they make Ukraine stronger, more resilient, and especially when we see uh, the behavior of Russia, it is important to have resilient societies, strong societies, and modern uh, societies, uh, stronger societies, uh, created by vigorously uh, pursuing reforms, is actually a way also to increase the security of uh, Georgia and Ukraine. Okay, we'll go to GOTV, second row. Khalid from Geo Television News. Uh, Secretary General, uh, day before yesterday, high-level military delegation from Pakistan visited NATO headquarters. And uh, what are the state of affairs between NATO and Pakistan, uh, particularly regarding Afghanistan? And in addition to that, I would like to ask, uh, will you be willing to uh, support through your infrastructure to Afghan people if there is uh, humanitarian aid requires? Thank you very much. The humanitarian situation in Afghanistan uh, is uh, dire, dire and very difficult and uh, this is of course of great concern for all of us uh, and uh, winter is coming and uh, uh, we know that uh, many people uh, uh, are at risk of suffering and, uh, and, uh, and having a very difficult time throughout the uh, winter. Uh, therefore, I welcome that uh, uh, many NATO allies are uh, uh, providing uh, humanitarian aid to Afghanistan uh, through the UN uh, and through different uh, relief organizations. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, extremely important and something uh, which uh, demonstrates the, 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 the will and the commitment of NATO allies to continue to uh, support the people of Afghanistan. Uh, this is something they do to the UN and different uh, uh, bilateral arrangements and, uh, and relief organizations, and I think that's the best of organizing this kind of humanitarian uh, support to the people of, uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, when it comes to Pakistan, uh, NATO has had, a, has regular, have had regular contacts with uh, Pakistan for many, many years. Uh, of course, not least um, discussing the situation in, in Afghanistan. Um, we have political contacts, so we have regular military uh, uh, contacts and dialogue, and I think this is important that this continues uh, because there are still uh, uh, many challenges in the region, especially related to the future of uh, Afghanistan. Thank you. We can now take a couple of questions online, uh, and uh, I think Reuters, Sabine Ziebold, uh, is on the line. Thank you. Um Secretary General, I was wondering, um, there have been reports about Russia mobilizing reservists uh, in the Ukraine crisis. Can you confirm these reports? And could you tell us more um, in how far uh, Russia's military posture uh, along Ukraine's border has changed over the last couple of days? Thank you. I cannot go into the details about our intelligence, uh, but what I can say is that we see concentration of forces, which is unusual. Uh, we have seen a build-up, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is the second time uh, this year. Uh, and uh, you have to understand this in the broader context, uh, that, that this is a military build-up by a country which has invaded Ukraine before. They did so in 2014 when they illegally annexed Crimea and they continue to support the separatists in Donbas and eastern Ukraine. Uh, and then uh, what they do now is also combined with uh, aggressive rhetoric and we have seen uh, many, many times how Russia has been responsible for hybrid and cyber, cyber attacks against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, and what we now see is uh, the deployment of heavy equipment, uh, armored vehicles, um, uh, tanks, drones, uh, and also uh, electronic warfare uh, systems uh, together with combat-ready uh, troops. So we are monitoring this very closely. We collect information, we share information, and we also send a, a clear message to Russia uh, that uh, they need to de-escalate, to reduce tensions, uh, to be transparent, uh, uh, and also uh, that uh, any use of force against Ukraine uh, will have consequences, will have costs for uh, Russia. The next question I have is uh, Vege, Alpiane Jonsson. 
Thank you, Anna. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, we heard President Zelensky's alarming statement this morning describing an alleged plan for a coming uh, uh, a few weeks forward. So I wonder if you would comment on that. And I also would like to ask you about the possible military reaction or military support that NATO might or might not provide to Ukraine in the case of these Russian forces to cross the border. Thank you. So we are deeply concerned about what we see. And uh, uh, we are monitoring very closely the developments and then sharing uh, information with, uh, with allies. Uh, there is no certainty about the intentions of Russia, but we see the track record of what Russia has done against Ukraine before and continue to do by occupying uh, Crimea, destabilizing Donbass by supporting the separatists there, and being a responsible for cyber and hybrid attacks against uh, the legal government uh, in Kiev against uh, Crimea. And then when you also see the rhetoric uh, from Russia and the disinformation, uh, then of course all uh, together this provides very strong reasons to be deeply concerned and therefore we need to follow, we need to uh, monitor closely what they do and to, co and to continue to urge Russia to de-escalate and to reduce tension and to be transparent uh, because that's the best way to also avoid miscalculation, misunderstandings that can create situations that are dangerous and spiral out of uh, control. NATO provides support to Ukraine. Uh, we do that as an alliance and also NATO allies uh, provide uh, uh, support uh, directly to Ukraine uh, with different types of capacity building, uh, with training, uh, with uh, supplies of different capabilities, uh, 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 different uh, weapon systems. Uh, and, uh, and therefore NATO allies and NATO provide significant political and military support to Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is a partner uh, of NATO, it's, uh, it's not a, a NATO member, so our collective defense clause, Article 5, does not apply for Ukraine. But we will also send a clear message to Russia uh, that uh, uh, NATO is there to defend and protect all allies uh, if uh, that is needed or uh, uh, because we need to make sure that there is no misunderstanding, no room for miscalculation about NATO's resolve, capability and will to defend all NATO allies. We have a next question from uh, NRK. Peter Svart. Thank you. Um, Military analysts tell NRK that China is unlikely to give up coal-fired power plants as long as the country is in a strategic conflict with the United States. They argue China will need to keep coal as energy security for fear of oil disruption in a crisis. What is um, uh, your and NATO's view on this? So first of all, what we see now is a significant military build-up by uh, China. Uh, they uh, have the second largest defense budget in the world. They have all the biggest navy in the world, uh, and they will soon have the biggest economy in the world. And they are investing more and more into advanced military capabilities, including advanced weapon systems, long-range missiles, hypersonic uh, glide vehicles, uh, and uh, significantly expanding their nuclear arsenal. All of this matters for our security, and we also see that China is coming closer to us in cyberspace, but also in space, uh, and we see them investing also heavily in critical infrastructure in our own countries to try to control uh, critical infrastructure, for instance, in, uh, in Europe. That's the reason why NATO had, has, has uh, uh, increased uh, the focus, the attention we uh, we, 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 we have uh, on, uh, on China as, as not an adversary, but as a global power that matters for our security. We will continue to reach out to China. Uh, we need to engage with China on issues like uh, arms control or, for instance, uh, climate change. Um, it's not for NATO to have specific opinions about uh, how to implement the 
uh, Paris Accord and the different uh, climate change agreements. But what I can say is that NATO has made climate change an important issue for our alliance because uh, global warming uh, is a crisis multiplier. Uh, it fuels conflicts. It uh, forces millions of people to, uh, to move. And therefore, we need to both make sure that we fully understand the link between uh, climate change and crisis. We need to adapt our armed forces to a more extreme weather. And we need to make sure that our armed forces uh, help to reduce emissions. There is no way we can reach uh, uh, a global zero or a net zero uh, without also reducing emissions from military activities. So I just expect that also China live up to their commitments and uh, reduce emissions as they have uh, promised. Thank you. We'll take our last question from uh, NTB, Johan Falnes. Thank you, Wana. Um, Secretary General, just going back to the ban treaty, do you expect this to be discussed in Riga? And also, what do you actually ask from the Norwegian government and the German government? Do you ask them not to go through their plans to join us of service to the first treaty conference? And just a, a short second question, if I may. Uh, your term ends next year. Are you a candidate for the position as uh, governor for the Norwegian Central Bank? Thank you. Um, first, on the ban uh, treaty, I have discussed this issue also with the incoming uh, German Chancellor, uh, and uh, uh, I welcome his very clear uh, stand and also the, the, the position expressed in the government the platform on, of the incoming uh, German government that they will not uh, uh, join, not uh, sign up to the ban treaty because the way to achieve a world without nuclear weapons is balanced, verifiable arms control, not uh, unilateral uh, arms uh, reductions. Um, uh, then uh, I expect that uh, uh, arms control will be an important issue in general at the upcoming uh, defense, uh, foreign ministerial meeting in uh, Riga. Uh, I have actually prepared a discussion on that because I think that NATO has to uh, strengthen and to step up our efforts uh, on arms control to make sure that we make progress and that we are also addressed together uh, the fact that we actually have seen um, the demise of some important arms control agreements, not least the INF Treaty that banned all uh, intermediate range weapons. Uh, uh, the demise of that treaty was caused by the Russian deployment of uh, uh, intermediate range uh, weapon systems, uh, but we need uh, to continue to uh, work for uh, arms control, uh, balanced arms control, and also to find ways to include uh, new and disruptive technologies, and also to engage China in meaning meaningful dialogue arms control, on arms control. So there are many issues. Uh, I look forward to the discussion with foreign ministers. I also expect that part of this broader discussion on arms control, the ban treaty will be addressed. Uh, I welcome that the German uh, uh, government platform of the incoming uh, German government clearly states that they will consult with allies and that all allies uh, also clearly states that they will not join uh, the ban treaty. They believe in multilateral uh, disarmament and that's the best way to reach um, the goal uh, of a world without nuclear uh, weapons. And all allies agree on that. They have a clear position on these uh, issues. Uh, then on my future in Norway, that, this is not the time to comment on that. Uh, that's something I will address uh, when, I, when I am closer to, uh, to coming back to Norway. And with that, we conclude this press conference. Hopefully, see you all in Riga next week. Thank you.